in quarantine session where, you know, we're doing all of this sort of stuff electronically. And uh, in, in the past, we had the option, at least for those of us who are local, of meeting face to face for things. But now we're all more or less in the same boat or really ought to be for practicing what we're supposed to do. So it uh, looks like there's a lot of questions there for me already. I'll start going at them. And uh, let's see what we've got here first. So uh, Ultra Peter asks, can I comment on Nietzsche's criticism of the American work ethic in the gay science? And has a follow-up, is there a difference in the attitude towards work ethic in Catholicism and Protestantism? Um, so Nietzsche, you know, Nietzsche himself didn't care an awful lot about the Americans, um, but he did think that, and he expressed this in, in, in multiple points, what we often think of as the prototypical American work ethic, which is, you know, you work all the time and you're, you know, you're valued in terms of your work. He saw that starting to trickle into Europe and he thought that that was a bad thing. And so he thought that this, this notion that we have to be accountable all the time. I mean, you see some of this in, in the people today who are all about hustling during the coronavirus crisis. There's that meme of that guy going around saying, if you haven't done this and haven't done this and haven't done this and started a business by the time the crisis finishes, you're, you're, you, know, you lack discipline. Well, that would be exactly the sort of thing that Nietzsche would say is, is problematic. And, you know, it's interesting. So, uh, you know, you're not asking about, for example, um, Rainer Maria Rilke, but I'm going to bring him up anyway, because he and Nietzsche both talk about the term solitude, Einsamkeit, something I'm actually going to be doing a presentation on for the STOA um, two Saturdays from now. So, you know, it's not just being by yourself, but cultivating something within you that allows you to be on your own. That is what these, these thinkers thought of as, as solitude in an important sense. It can also be translated, by the way, as loneliness, but that, that's a different uh, notion there. And so Nietzsche thought that, you know, we need to be able to have what you might call unprogrammed time in order to live a decent life. And this always on the move, always on the make, overscheduling ourselves sort of attitude towards things is actually not good for the human being, um, whether you want to call it the soul or, you know, of course, Nietzsche is a materialist, so the spirit comes out of the body, but he, th he just still does think that we're not just simply reducible to our bodies. Um, so that's something quite valuable. Is there a difference between... Um, Protestant and Catholic work ethics. You should always avoid uh, when you, when you're looking at religious studies. You should always avoid Catholic versus Protestant anything because Protestants are such a motley mix across the board, um, even just in their beginnings. Not to mention in the present today, and Catholics aren't all of one piece. You know, Weber has that Protestant work ethic and spirit of capitalism, and there's something to that, but he's not talking about all Protestants. He's talking in particular about the Reformed and Lutheran traditions, and, um, you know, there's, there's interesting work done by anthropologists who then said, well, does this apply to, say, uh, you know, low church Protestants in the American South or, or not, you know? And, and so you've you got to avoid making massive generalizations like that. You can find Protestants and Catholics who are incredibly uh, unmotivated and lazy, and you can find Catholics and Protestants who think that the entire world should consist of work, and you can find everything in between. So I wouldn't say that there's, there's a fundamental difference between those in terms of those denominational divides. All right. Um, Caesar, I am Caesar asks, are you going to make more esoteric videos about artworks? Can you make one about Walter Benjamin's idea of an artwork aura? So I don't do esoteric stuff. Um, you might mean something different by esoteric than I do. For me, esoteric is sort of like mystic. It's one of those ambiguous terms and I'm not particularly interested in esoteric stuff. Um, and I'm not particularly interested in, in uh, trying to like, you know, call out that. I, I think that esotericism is actually kind of a, you know, there's, there's all sorts of projects like
that, that ain't for me. I'm interested in looking at what's actually in text, not reading a whole bunch of stuff into them or trying to find the hidden meaning. It's enough to actually find the meaning that's that's in there that we can we can more or less agree upon. Would I do something on Walter Benjamin? Yeah, but he is not high on my list of priorities. You know, um, as I've always said, I prioritize videos for my current students who I'm teaching. And so like this month, I'm shooting some stuff on McIntyre and some stuff on Cicero and we'll see what else, man, well, William James, because those are the immediate needs. Uh, Benjamin is, is somebody who is interesting, but you know, I'm not a, a specialist in him and I don't teach him in my, my classes. So Cynthia says, thank you. A very nice uh, thank you, Cynthia. Um, glad to, to be of help. Um, Yuri, I think is how it's pronounced. What are my thoughts on the importance of myths in Plato's dialogues? Well, that's a good question. So as Socrates himself says in the Republic, we make recourse to myths when we sort of run out of the you know rational dialectical account. And you'll notice that, that Plato uses myths basically in two ways. One is precisely that. You know, we use them to sort of speculate once we get beyond the realm, provide some sort of symbolic representation of things. And their myths start to blend into allegories, right? So, you know, is, is for example, um, the uh, discussion of, of the chariot as the soul in the Phaedrus, is that mythological? Yeah, kind of, you know, and the gods are being mentioned, but it's all within a sort of platonic framework, right? It's not, you know, and that's the other thing too. Plato plays around with and transforms traditional myths. Um, it's, it's a mistake to try to read Plato in terms of the framework that that traditional mythology, which was always a heterogeneous, her, heterogeneous kind of mess, it was never like all on one page. It's a it's, it's a mistake to try to read rationalist Plato uh, from that perspective into to that that whole thing their, their own sake. Right. That said, there is a very strong religious uh, dimension to to Platonism. Um, there always has been, and so you know it's kind of. Kind of cool to think about that. I, you know, it's interesting too. I, I did this project with a um, a student years and years back when I was an ass assistant professor at Fayetteville State University, and they were doing this this research thing. You know, trying to hook up uh, very uh, ahead of the curve students with professors who would be willing to help them carry out research. And so one of my students who other, you know, if, if it wasn't for the fact that her husband died while she was in the process of doing this, she, you know, her husband was, was in uh, the 82nd Airborne, Fayetteville State University is right, right by Fort Bragg. She probably would have actually gotten this done and, and, you know, gone to a conference and, and actually presented it and then written an article. And so, um, it was about, you know, the myths of the afterlife in Plato. And we looked at all of them and we're mapping them out. And they don't all map onto each other perfectly well, you know. So they're, they're there to make us think. They're not there to provide us with the answers to everything, I would say. All right. Nazim asks, Dr. Sadler, how do you reconcile providence and divine immutability with, with genuine human freedom? Well, you know, the same way that Augustine and Boethius and Anselm do, you know, I think that God created human beings with free wills, and that's part of what it means to be that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, the, you know, I buy into the eternalism sort of metaphysics of that. I don't have any problem with looking at things that way myself. Not everybody does, but we don't all have to agree on metaphysics. All we have to do is acknowledge that whatever metaphysical stance we pick, it's not, you know, like the nature of things imposed it upon us that involves some choice on our parts and different metaphysics come with, you might say, different implications and commitments. All right, uh, Ken Blackwell says, I find most original works on Stoicism to be fairly easy to read, Marcus Aurelius, Seneca, Epictetus, and others. The exception is Musonius Rufus. Is there a primer that I could recommend? I do believe that the the book that you can get his lectures and um, fragments in 
does uh, include like a, a lengthy forward. It's uh, Cynthia, somebody who was the translator, I believe, right? Um, so, you know, I, I would take a look at that and I would, I would actually go to Google Scholar and, and, you know, plonk Musonius Rufus in there and just see what pops up. Um, there might be some some decent article fragmentary. I mean, it's interesting stuff. You know, you notice that I've I've cited him like in my discussion of stoicism and relationships, and I bring him up when it comes to stoicism and in accordance with nature, right? So um, you know, that's that's uh, those are some starting points um, that you might uh, check out. Um, let's see what else we've got here. Nathan says, I'm going to do some maths while I wait. Okay, well, that, that's always good to do. Uh, Lucas, did Nietzsche actually believe in the eternal return, or did he only use it as a metaphor or thought experiment? So this is, this is a, a question on which Nietzsche scholarship is quite divided. Um, my personal view is that the eternal recurrence of the same is, is not particularly important within the scope of Nietzsche's work. Um, will to power is, a, you know, I agree with, like, say, Heidegger, for example. Will to power is the much more central metaphysical notion. Um, and I do think it, it's it's really sort of a, a, a thought experiment and, and a point. There are some people out there who are really attracted to the idea, and so they try to blow it up into, like, the hermeneutic principle to read Nietzsche through, but... I just not, I don't find that convincing, you know. It's not as if he's constantly talking about it. Whereas there are themes that he is more constantly talking about. This is a great example too by the way of, you know, I mentioned a little bit earlier, I'm not into the esoteric and I'm not into esotericism as a way of doing philosophy and reading past philosophical thinkers. Um I think that if you want to, you know, read a thinker you know, if they say uh, over and over again, this is really, really important, you take those things as being really important and you don't take the odd reference over here or over here uh, made, you know, a few once or a few times as being the centrally important thing. So, all right, let's see. Uh, what else have we got? I'm going to take this one by Mr. Dharam Paji. What is the best advice to succeed as a PhD student of philosophy? So there, there isn't any best advice because different PhD students are in different programs and are faced with different situations. So there, there can't be a best advice or best piece of advice. Instead, uh, I think you, you could say that there's some basic best practices, some of which may apply to your situation and some of which may not. I think one of the things that could be the most useful um, is uh, thinking about um, the, the people that you're going to study with. Don't take their points of view on philosophy and especially on its history and on who's important and who's not. Don't take them. Uh, uncritically as the gospel truth about things. I, I see so many people who do this. They're like, well, my instructors say blah, 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 blah. And you're like, well, whoever told you that they, they knew everything? I mean, why don't you look around and see what else you could be studying? I mean, if I had just gone with what my undergraduate, think, uh, my undergraduate professors had said, um, then I would have, you know, missed out on a whole bunch of, of philosophical things that later on I, I came to study and, and much of it on my own. So, so there's that aspect. Um, you also want to be able to judiciously uh, incorporate criticism. Remember that if you're in graduate studies, you're not coming in as the, you know, the, the smart kid who knows everything. You're coming in as somebody who's pretty smart, who's going to learn a lot along the way, and is going to screw up things along the way. So even if your professors are kind of pricks about the way that they give you feedback, you know, it doesn't have to be a personal thing. You can say, well, okay, um, I, I can find some of their feedback useful. Uh, the other thing I would say is don't get in, and this is from personal experience, don't get into jockeying stuff with, um, 
uh, other grad students about like who knows this better, you know, who's studying the most important stuff. I did that myself and I, I did okay in those contests because I could think on my feet quickly and I was, I was pretty smart and I read a lot. Um, but it was all like a total waste of time. You know, I, I don't, I don't keep in touch with those people anymore. And, um, what they think about stuff doesn't concern me at all. And, and, uh, except for one, you know, Phil Dean, who I still keep in touch with off and on, but he and I, he and I are good friends. Um, so, you know, maybe that would be helpful, uh, uh, in, in, in how to succeed. The, I mean, the other thing I'll say too is, so if you're a PhD student in philosophy, you will eventually have to write a dissertation. The best piece of advice I got about dissertations came from one of the people on my committee, which I didn't actually listen to, but I, I now realize is really great advice. The only good dissertation is a done dissertation. Don't try to do the, the you know, next amazing piece of literature because you're not going to. You know, don't pick a sexy topic that everybody's talking about this year because they won't be talking about it next year. Pick something that's manageable, problem, some issue, and just write your dissertation about that and get it done. And then use the skills that you've learned about research to write your next book, which you actually will care more about, right? Your dissertation is your, your first book. Um, if you turn it into your pet project, as I did, then you wind up with something that's too large to be to be publishable and needs a lot of work and could probably be split into three books. But I'm not going to do that with mine. You know, it's been almost almost 20 years since I since I did my dissertation. All right, here's a good question from Jeff Sullivan. Many people are reading the plague recently, but there are, are are there any other philosophical works you think are particularly relevant to our time? Thinking of finally giving Dostoevsky's Demons a read. Thanks. Yeah, it's funny that people are buying up the plague as if that's like super relevant to everything that's that's going on right now. I mean, it's a great book, and I love Camus, but I think a lot of people are going to be disappointed as they're reading it. Because and, and a lot of people are going to buy it, put it on, read a little bit of it, and put it on their shelves, and that's going to be that's going to be it. So, um, you know, same thing by the way happened when Trump got elected with Hannah Arendt's *The Origins of Totalitarianism*. Everyone's like, "Oh, I got to read this great book," and I, I, you know, I've read *Origins of Totalitarianism* several times through, and I really like Arendt, and I was like, "Ooh." Yeah, you don't want to buy that. You know that that's a tough book. <laughs> you know, that's that's some pretty dry stuff. Okay, so are, are there are there stuff that's particularly relevant to our own time? So I'm gonna give you I'm gonna give you two answers to that. One is everything is still relevant as it was yesterday. You know, uh, there's I, I forget which saint they asked about this, and they said if you were gonna find out that you were gonna die in an hour, what would you do? And, and the person asking this saint thought, you know, you know, they'd like, I'd get on the phone and call my my parents, or I'd like, you know, immediately start praying and and set, you know, doing whatever I can to atone for my sins. And the saint was like, I wouldn't do anything differently than I'm doing now. I mean, if I if I'm actually doing the right thing right now, then it doesn't matter if I'm in a crisis situation. I'm not going to change course. You know, uh, so I, I think the same sort of thing can be said about reading. You know, we read Plato's uh, works and we read Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics and we read Epictetus's Discourses and we read Cicero's On the Ends and I go all the way through, right? All that stuff remains just as valuable right now. And, you know, you, then you apply it to the situation that you're in. So, for example, in thinking about the nature of justice, which you can do by reading, uh, you know, W.D. Ross's The Right and the Good, or you could think about it in terms of utilitarianism, or you could read Cicero, or you could read Aristotle, going outside when you know that you might be uh, endangering other people, it's the wrong thing to do. And you can find all sorts of discussions in general that would then apply to that, right? Um, now, is there anything that that's particularly good to read during during times of sickness that has to do with our our situation structurally? Uh, I guess. I mean, some of Philip Dick's novels might be interesting or helpful, but I I don't know that we need to read things fictionally, particularly about plague times. I mean, 
there's some good epidemiological stuff out there. There's a great book I had years and years ago called Plagues and People that I, I remember reading and enjoying and it helped put some things into perspective. And um, by the way, Dostoevsky's Demons or The Possessed, I think that's Dostoevsky's best work. But that that's my view. A lot of other people, Brothers Karamazov or, you know, uh, Crime and Punishment. But I, I really do think The Demons is is his best work. All right. Uh, let's see what we got here. Uh, let's skip down a little bit. Um, there's a lot of questions here. So, um, creative retrieval. What does our attitudes towards our distributed lives now tell us about how and whether we've been living a technologically enframed life? Not sure what distributed means in that in that uh, situation. We are living a technologically enframed life. Uh, if we weren't, you couldn't watch me right here, right now, right? Um, I rely on, on you know, this this Mac that I'm I'm working on, uh, the keyboard of which is getting kind of wonky these days. I hope it doesn't go out because Apple Genius bars, of course, are closed. And my iPhone, I rely on those incredibly heavily, and that's allowed me to continue engaging with people and teaching my my classes to my academic students and working with clients and, you know, um, so maybe, maybe, you know, what you're asking about is now that we're all inside, do we see that we're more technologically in frame that that could be driven home to some people. But, um, I mean, I, you know, this is so, this is something I said, I used to do these, these things called, um, dot, like the technosphere videos. If you just put it in, you can, you can find them. They're all, you know, from quite a ways before. I didn't do any since I moved here to Milwaukee. They're all from when I was in New York. I think I call them technosphere reflections. One of the things I realized back in the early uh, two, 2000, you know, like uh, around 2009, 2010 was, like it or not, the, the breakdown between like the virtual world and the actual world, the actual world is now permeated with the virtual world. And there's, you know, unless the whole internet goes down, there's no way around that. Now, it was permeated already by all sorts of other technology. I mean, you know, look at these, these bookshelves, right? These came from Ikea. They're prefab. Um, every one of these books was printed, well, except for some very old ones, you know. Uh, they're, they're printed on, on, on nowadays sort of technological uh, devices that are run by computers. And before that, it was, you know, other technology, the printing press and you know, so we're not outside of technological and framing. It's just a question of what it, you know, what kind of technology it is and how it permeates things and how we use it, how we conceptualize it, whether we sort of swim like the fish in the water who can't realize that they're in it or whether we do the technological optimism of, oh my God, this is this new iPhone is going to change my life entirely, right? Or whether we're more critical and careful about it. So... All right, Storm Slayer, you might get asked this a lot, but is it too late to start studying philosophy from scratch at 20? How long will it take me to understand philosophers like Heidegger, Deleuze, or Hegel? It's not too late at 20, and it's not too late at 60. I mean, Epicurus says that, right? It's not too late at in, in old age. It's, uh, it's always a good time to start studying philosophy. And understanding, there's different levels and different layers of understanding. Uh, depends on what you're asking about. And there is isn't there is no like numerical answer for that. It depends on how much time you put in and how much thought you, you do and what approach you take. Um, reading philosophy will not be re like reading tech, tech, you know, technical manuals or learning how to code or something like that. It's way more complex. There's a lot more ambiguity. You have to read and reread. Um, so I can't I can't give you a prediction about how long it'll take you to understand Heidegger or even one of Heidegger's works, like say how long will it take you to understand what is metaphysics? And understanding is a cumulative process. You know, I understand more about Heidegger today than I did five years ago, than I did ten years ago, than I did when I first uh, encountered him in graduate school, like say in um, 1990. Seven, seven ninety six. Um, understanding is not something that you know. Understanding is not mastery. Understanding is not certification. Understanding is this this deepening process that goes on. And the other thing I'll say too is, as you understand one philosopher, in order to understand Heidegger, 
you do need to understand some some Aristotle and some Plato and some Augustine and some Hegel because Heidegger thinks that Hegel is quite important and some Nietzsche and some other people. And in return, it's not as if first you're going to you know, master these people and then you can like move on to the next thing. Understanding Heidegger is also going to help you re-understand Aristotle. You know, so when Heidegger says that Aristotle's rhetoric book two is a hermeneutic of Dasein, well, that's not in the Aristotle, but it, it helps you re, you know, re-understand what's going on in Aristotle. So, all right. Uh, Vitali says, are you familiar with esoteric Gnostic mystic material? It looks like many thinkers of the 19th century, like Goethe and Nietzsche, were affected by them. Also, Carl Jung was really interested in that. Yeah, I'm familiar with plenty of that stuff, and I did plenty of digging into it when I was an undergrad and grad student. And I, my, my general view was a lot of it was nonsense and, and a waste of my time. A lot of people get into it, I think, for because it satisfies some sort of emotional need. You know, Gnostics, most of the, the people who are self-described as Gnostics who I've met, and I've met quite a few in my time, typically have this, like, I'm in the know and everybody else is a dummy kind of thing, you know. Hans Jonas, by the way, I'm looking over there because I've got his book right there about the Gnostic religion. He's got this great discussion of existentialism in the end where, you know, he, he looks at, you know, classical Gnostic uh, stuff that he's spent the entire time unpacking. By the way, student of Heidegger, you know. Um, and then he talks about current existentialism, and he says, this is a tendency in existentialism, thinking that, like, we're the elite. We know more than everybody else. Was Nietzsche drastically affected by them? No, not really. Um, I, know, I know there's, like, an interpretation of Nietzsche out there that says that. Was Goethe? Yeah, to some degree, and, and not that much. I mean, you know, when, when you look at Faustus or, you know, the, the, you know, the, the color uh, doctrine, um, what is it, whatever it is, far they are, right? Um, they're not, you don't have to understand that sort of stuff. Now, if you're like a Steinerian, right, a, a, an anthroposophist, well, you're going to be really into that, and that's how you're going to read uh, Goethe and Nietzsche. But um, that's not the majority view in, in, in scholarship on that. And Carl Jung was affected by that, and for me, that makes Carl Jung less. But what do you do, you know? That is what it is for me. Johan says, I just got done reading McIntyre's After Virtue. Don't really get his view of human nature and how he solves the criticism of essentialism. Is it possible without essentialism? He never mentions essentialism in the book, as far as I know. So I'm not sure where you're getting. This is from some gloss on McIntyre that you're getting somewhere else, I think, right? Um, you don't get his view on human nature. Human nature is is complex and developmental. I mean, it's... it's uh, partly revealed to us in an Aristotelian framework, but we need to go beyond the Aristotelian framework, which is what exactly what the Aristotelian framework properly applied would require us to do. It was, you know, I think you want to, you probably want to reread and you want to go on and read uh, the rest of the, uh, uh, what's the equivalent of a trilogy, Quaterni, of uh, Who's Justice, Which Rationality, which builds on After Virtue, um, in which he might actually mention essentialism, um, but it's it's not it's not a term that I, I recall ever having seen in that work. Um, and then um, <clears throat> three three rival versions and dependent rational animals. But I mean McIntyre's view on human nature, I, I view it as quite you know it's it's what Aristotle would be doing were he around today, and it's what you know people like Lacan, who McIntyre by the way was quite interested in. Um, and presumably still is, he's not dead, right? Uh, would have to, to, to say about that. So, um, all right, uh, let's see what else we've, uh, got going on here. Um, I just skipped again a little bit here. Um, it's bouncing around even more. Here we go. Um, Rapa, I've recently finished Crime and Punishment and have been thinking about murder lately as morbid as it sounds. Do you have any recommendations on philosophers who've written about murder? Well, yeah, sure. I mean, many of them have throughout history. Aristotle actually talks about that as one of the things that there is no proper mean for in Nicomachean ethics, right? Um, there's lots of, of discussions about killing and murder running throughout the history of philosophy. So I don't, I mean, and, 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 you know, if you want a philosopher 
who people are now reading today, who uh, originally said that suicide was the problem posed by the absurd, and now murder is the problem posed by the absurd. Read uh, Albert Camus' The Rebel, because that's what he says in, in his introduction, right? Um, that's how his thought evolved. Um, and, you know, The Rebel, like a lot of Camus' stuff, it is good philosophy, but you got to kind of wade through his style. It's not for everybody, so. Mm. Maxwell, have you found much philosophical value in Shakespeare's plays? What do you think is Shakespeare's unique contribution to the history of thought? That's a good question. I, I haven't been able to spend time reading Shakespeare for many years. As a matter of fact, I haven't read a Shakespeare play since we moved here to Milwaukee, now that I think about it. And I do have my dad's old uh, collected works of William Shakespeare, one of the things I inherited from him. Uh, he was he was very into that, you know, in the super fine print on the very thin paper. Um, I should probably go back and, and read it. You know, I, I really did enjoy reading Shakespeare's plays and uh, puttered around with, with his sonnets as well. Um, I think that uh, Shakespeare, you know, this and this is not like my idea. This is something I'm basically getting from, from Borges and from Bakhtin. Um, Shakespeare is kind of similar to Dostoevsky in that he's a, what Bakhtin, Mikhail Bakhtin calls a polysemic uh, author. Um, there's a lot of ethical ideas being worked out, but there's no like place where you can say, this is Shakespeare saying this right here, this character stands for him. It's rather in the way in which he structures things um, that, that it works out that way. And I think you can say similar things too, by the way, of Sophocles. Um, in, in many cases, maybe even Eschelus too. Um, Euripides, I'm not sure. Hey, Bruce, glad to see you here as well. Thanks. All right. Um, Zach asks, what are some great Hispanic philosophers to start reading? I want to get involved in reading more Spanish and have only begun with Miguel de Unamuno and we'll soon start Ortega y Gasset. So I'm not, I'm not a great person to ask about this in part because I'm Uno more than I enjoy Ortega y Gasset. Um, somebody else you should check out is Maria Zambrano, uh, interesting phenomenologist and games and things like that. You know, I don't, I don't really know Spanish literature very well, so I can't, I can't make any decent recommendations. Maybe some other people can weigh in in the thread if you read down below. Uh, oh, Calypso, which book or books of the Bible do you find most insightful or enjoyable to read? Well, this will not be a surprise to anybody. The wisdom literature. <laughs> I'm a philosopher, right? Uh, and by the way, there's a really great book, a classic work on the wisdom literature by Gerhard von Rad. Um, I think it's just called the wisdom literature. And he talks about it as being the philosophy of, um, of you know, the, the ancient uh, Jewish writers. So, you know, what does the wisdom literature comprise? Um, quite a few books that are, that are canonical for both uh, all the early churches and Protestants, like Book of Proverbs, Book of Job, which is essentially a philosophical dialogue, um, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs. The Psalms are part of the wisdom literature. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, there was a long-standing tradition that the Psalms were essentially the fifth gospel because every single you know, thing was supposed to be both about Christ. It was also supposed to be about every single possible way in which the human being could be oriented towards God emotionally. By the way, the, the, the fifth gospel thing mentioned in Thomas Aquinas's commentary on the Psalms before anybody starts saying, oh, heresy or something like that, right? Um, then we have, you know, works like uh, Sirach and the Book of Wisdom, brilliant stuff, really, really great stuff. Considered canonical for everybody except for the Protestants, uh, because Martin Luther narrowed the canon of the, of the Bible. Um, but all the all the the you know apostolic churches have those in their works. I also I gotta admit I like the Book of Judges, but it's because it's this crazy stuff about like Samson and you know the the, the stuff that he was doing and Deborah and you know Baruch and all that. It's, it's, it's um, tell you what I don't like. Um, not into the ap apocalyptic literature. I find that stuff really kind of a, a, you know, a waste of my time. And I get people who ask me about that, that sort of stuff. Um, what are you going to do? You know, um, 
I, I think, you know, people who obsess about what's going on in Daniel and ignore the, say, the Sermon on the Mount have kind of got their priorities mixed up. So, all right. Um, Austin Noonan is kind of phenomenologist. Nope, <laughs> he's not. Although all phenomenologists have drawn upon Kant, and he's well worth studying. Uh, human evolution in regards to Stoicism, if everything is faded, how do we make sense of topics like freedom, choice, and judgments? This is a topic I've studied a bit, still have trouble grasping. Here's, here's something you might think about, and you've, you've asked me about this in other places, right? So to begin with, faded for Stoics doesn't mean the same thing as like absolutely determined in every single way, right? So you got to read that term differently. Um, and think about it, this might be helpful for you, because this is a complex topic. Stoics are compatibilists, right? And the question with compatibilists that we always have to ask is, well, how does that actually work? And there's many different stories out there. And you got to go to the texts, right? And you got to spend time with those. Think about it as existing in a world that, that's more or less deterministic. And we've got this little range in which we can actually choose things. And we do have the freedom to operate within that. And every time that we do, we sort of penetrate the determinism and move it around a little bit and it takes sense of it. But the Stoics definitely think that we're responsible for our actions. And, you know, you think about it this way. A lot of what Stoicism is saying is pay attention to what's going on in your processes, because then the little bit of freedom that you have, you can use so that you're not just operating on automatic, right? Engaging in lines of thinking that, that are essentially determined, um, we have the opportunity to intervene within the determinism. All right, uh, Chris, I love philosophy, but find I'm a relatively slow thinker. It takes time to get my head around new concepts in philosophy and otherwise. Any advice on remedying this? Yeah, don't remedy it. There's nothing wrong with being a slow thinker. A um, lot of people, being, being fast is overrated. A lot of people are fast and flashy, and, and it turns out that they don't actually grasp the things when you you ask them about it later on. Um, there's nothing wrong with, with taking time. Uh, everybody learns at their own pace. Everybody reflects at their own pace. And ideas grow and, and get brought together into configurations at their own pace as well. Um, you don't have to try to like live up to some sort of schedule and the goal for philosophy is to engage in lifelong learning. And so, you know, don't, don't feel bad about that and don't let other people make you feel bad about that. Um, you might, you know, think about the example of Thomas Aquinas, the, you know, who got called in his own time, the dumb ox, right. And then goes on to become one of the most brilliant thinkers of the West of his, his time recognized, of course, by his teacher, Albert the Great, but not recognized by his classmates. So, all right, uh, disciple of Ra, Marcus Aurelius witnessed a plague in his time. What can we learn from him? That's a great question to punt onto Donald Robertson, who wrote a whole book about how to think like a Roman emperor, <laughs> and who does all sorts of stuff about, about that. Um, so, you know, he, my, my friend and colleague, he, he could answer that much better, and I would look him up. Uh, X, have I thought about writing a book on Stoicism? If so, what, what type? Yeah, I've thought about it. I've, I've also talked about it quite a bit. I have a couple irons in the fire. I'm working on a book on, you know, a book on Stoicism and anger, which I may be co-writing with a friend and colleague. Um, and, you know, I've got a few other projects ongoing as well. Um, mostly, you know, I'm shooting videos, so, uh, but eventually I do need to buckle down. Uh, Little Yell asks, do you actually enjoy reading philosophy or do you only care about the thoughts contained? Uh, uh, Kierkegaard versus Husserl question, I guess. <clears throat> I find Husserl boring, by the way, for the most part. Um, but I, but I read them because, you know, you got to take your medicine. It's important sometimes. Um, I, I really enjoy reading philosophy, but I enjoy, I enjoy reading and I've been, you know, conversing with these people to use Machiavelli's view, uh, or his, his way of looking at these things. If you don't know, Machiavelli had a day job and then he'd come home, change his clothes into like the robes of the ancients and he'd go into his study and then he would like have his conversations with Livy and the other ancient historians about the nature of politics. Um, 
so I, I, you know, I really enjoy reading philosophy. When it comes to reading a lot of the the classic thinkers, I don't find reading a lot of you know contemporary philosophy particularly enjoyable. Um, just sometimes because the writers are a little bit too precious, uh, or they don't seem to be well informed enough about what they're they're writing about. You know, they have a very narrow view on on things and background. But I, I do enjoy. You know, I, there, there's times where I, I read some of my colleagues' stuff, and I'm like, oh, man, this is really awesome stuff, you know. So, you know, some prime examples, right? Nobody reads Becker's A New Stoicism for its style, right? But it's a great book, and Becker is brilliant. Um, somebody else who uh, would uh, – where is, where is it? I must have taken it down. My colleague Chris Gill, I like reading his stuff quite a bit, right? He, he's definitely worth worth checking out, but I don't know where. I, I think it, it's around here somewhere. Um, so, you know, it, it varies quite a bit. All right. Um, let's see. Leila, you recently did a video on George Dickey. Can you say something about what he thought about aesthetic evaluation? Thank you. I'm not an expert on Dickey. I only I only did that stuff for my uh, Ethics for Artists and Designers class to give us some ideas about what is art. Um, I can't say that I've, I've you know read through his works very much. I was interested primarily in his his uh, art world theory of art that he's. He, by the way, he didn't originate. Danto originated that. So I, I don't probably I probably don't know enough about it to say much competent uh, on, on that. Um, Shabnam Singla, any advice for a college philosophy major when one one starts to question the importance of academic philosophy and actually changing the real world? Yeah, don't don't expect academic philosophy to actually change the real world. Applications of academic philosophy can go out there and change the real world, but but philosophy by itself isn't going to do that. Nor is sociology, nor is history, nor is uh, you know studying code or any of this sort of stuff. It's all what we do with it, right? So don't don't set the bar so high. I would say, um, and realize that the what what matters most is if you want to do something with philosophy in a very practical way. You have to create opportunities. You have to make contacts with people. You have to learn how to take philosophical ideas and communicate them effectively to ordinary people, or they're, they're really not going to give you a hearing. Um, and I, that's where I see most of my academic colleagues failing. And a lot of them don't even like that. You know, they, they view that as debasing the philosophical coinage, or um, they're kind of afraid of doing it. You know, it's interesting. I, I remember a colleague who I wanted to have a sit down interview with years and years back. And the day of the interview, he had to cancel and he was like shaking. Right. And I, and I was like, what's wrong with you, man? And he's like, well, this idea of being on video and like maybe saying something that I would get wrong and, and everybody in the world seeing it. And I was like, first of all, nobody's not everybody in the world is going to watch this video. Right? Um, but it's not that big of a deal. You know, you, uh, you know, you, you, you got to like, if you're going to break into doing this sort of thing, you got to like uh, uh, develop a little tougher skin. Um, so, you know, I, I would say those are those are important things. And the other thing, as I was mentioning earlier, whatever your professors are saying, this is the important stuff, all this other stuff isn't important. They they're they're probably not right about that. I mean, what they're studying is and, and teaching is probably important. But there's so much that's worth studying out there that you don't want to just go by what, what they say can be done. There's so many people that, that set, you know, very narrow restrictions on what's possible. Um, all right. Uh, Solidus, what's the dialect of Kant's German? I'm deliberating to learn German after my Latin education, and I did hear German went into a significant change in the 20th century. I don't think Kant has a dialect. Um, I think he's writing in high German. Um, maybe what you're, you're hearing is like so date of the date, the date of case is sometimes getting assimilated into the accusative, but I mean, it's, it's, it's still the same language. So I, I wouldn't worry about that. I mean, Kant is just hard to understand, <laughs> hard to read, right? Um, Metallium reviewer uses polyrhythmic polysyllables. Do you have any tips for anyone trying to write every day? Is it a matter of hours? 
It's a matter of setting an hour and sticking to it. That's what it is, right? You got to like find a time and say that you're actually going to do writing at that time. That's why here in Milwaukee, there's, there's a national organization that's called Shut Up and Write. And we had, a, we had a group here in, in Milwaukee. Obviously, we're not meeting now. And we would meet at a coffee uh, shop just a couple blocks from here. And it, it, it's literally that. You sit down and everybody shuts the hell up and you write for an hour. And then after that, you get to chit-chat about what you're doing. Because if you're chit-chatting, you're not writing. And a lot of people will, instead of actually writing, will make outlines and, and project what they're going to do. And the only thing to do is to actually sit down and write. When I was working on my dissertation, the other really good bit of advice that I got that I put into practice was five days a week, like it or not, you got to write three pages. If you want to write more, you go ahead and write more. But you have to write three pages. And it can be, you know, uh, this sucks. I can't write anything. I've got no ideas in my head, but you got to fill up three pages. And then at the end of the week on Saturday, you go through your 15 or more pages and you say, okay, what of this is, is garbage and what of this is worth keeping? And if you get like three to five pages of good stuff out of there and you do that, you know, 50 weeks out of the year, that's 150 pages. That's a dissertation, a short dissertation, right? Um, so, you know, that that's the key is, is just to like decide on a time, make sure that you actually do some writing, even if you think it's garbage or drivel, you just keep on doing it. All right. Um, Ken Roberts. Oh, here, actually, uh, yeah. Um, is there anyone who talked about being as obsessively as Heidegger? Uh, yeah, Heideggerians. <laughs> Uh, Jean-Luc Marion, God without being, right? Um, people who are following on, on that sort of stuff. So, all right, uh, Nagoyan, uh, my undergrad class is reading Kant's Groundwork Section 1. I want to give them next some materials that critique Kant. Do you have any suggestions? Well, John Stuart Mill actually critiques Kant in utilitarianism. And in my view, gets Kant wrong. So that could be that could be kind of good. You know, he basic. So, you know, when it comes to the first formulation of the categorical imperative, right, there's there's two tests basically built into that. Is there what we call a contradiction in concept or notion? And is there a contradiction in willing or in consequences? And Mill uh, essentially you know, reinterprets Kant wrongly as saying that there, there, it really is just this uh, contradiction in consequences, and that's that's kind of a misguided view. So you can you can you can have a critique of Kant, and then you can have um, a why the critique goes wrong, and that you know, that's kind of fun to do. Um, you know, W. D. Ross, he criticizes Kant. Um, uh, in uh, the the right and the good, um, he thinks that duty is really important, but he thinks that Kant went wrong in saying we've got like one source of duty that we can use. So, all right, um, Pedro asks, have you thought about tackling Eastern philosophy? Um, yeah, I've thought about it, but I've rejected it in part because I don't read uh, Sanskrit or um, you know Pali or uh, classical Chinese or stuff like that. I mean, when I was studying Mandarin, I basically, you know, got to the level of being a, uh, a good beginner, but that's about as far as I got. I mean, I've taught this stuff, but if I'm going to put out videos, there's probably a lot of other people who'd be much better suited to that. I may have to do it eventually, but I'm going to have to be super careful about how I do it so I don't screw it up, you know? So... Um, and, and there's so much Western philosophy for me to get to as well. All right. Um, Nuku TV is teaching others the best way to learn. I find when it comes to learning philosophy, teaching ideas to myself helps best. Different people learn different ways. There isn't a best way to learn. Um, it's, it can often be quite good to like see whether you're, you're getting things right, whether you can explain it to somebody else. But there's many other ways to learn as well. And I, I, I think we don't want to try to have a single best that we rely on as, you know, the one thing. 
All right, I'm going to make an exception to taking more than one per more than one question by a person because it, it's it's germane to the shirt. Was I upset when McCarthy left the Packers? I was upset, you know, with McCarthy while he was with the Packers. So I was ecstatic when he left the Packers, and so were the Packers. I mean, you can see the difference in uh, the press conferences and how the team operates on the field, and of course, performance from uh, the the you know last three years with McCarthy when he was basically a dead weight on the team to this last season. I mean, thank God he's gone. And um, I, I'm so surprised that anybody wanted to hire him. It's going to be interesting to see how he screws up somebody else's team. Um, but, you know, more power to him. For those who don't know what I'm talking about, so I'm wearing my, my Packers shirt, you know, um, and McCarthy was head coach of the Packers and did take them to a Super Bowl, but then he allowed himself and his, his coaching and, and his uh, approaches to things to get very stale. And he was always kind of a stick in the mud kind of guy. I mean, LaFleur is, I, I really, I really like him, you know, as not just as a coach, but as the kind of person, the ethos that he projects. So, all right. Uh, let's see. Alush says, thanks for dedicating a lot of time for doing what you do. Second thing, I'm guessing I have to scroll down to find it here somewhere. Um, well, I don't see it, so maybe maybe I'll find it later. All right. Damon asks, for lockdown, reading the écrit, that's Lacan, right? Any more thoughts on this? Don't copy the math diagrams, which I did. Yeah, I mean, the, the math stuff that Lacan does is, it's interesting, but I wouldn't put too much stress on it. The other thing to keep in mind is Lacan is showing off a lot of the time to his colleagues and, and the wider world. Um, the seminars are always easier to read than the écrit. <laughs> Uh, for on the mirror phase, um, well, there's there's also great discussions of it in seminar one and seminar two as well, right? All right. Um, Mr. Big Weakney says, do you think our observations of the natural world suggest God or can we explain the natural world exclusively through natural reasons? I'd say neither, you know. Um, but I would also say that none of us have a comprehensive view on the natural world, and anybody who pretends to is, is you know, lying to you or <laughs> deluded, right? Uh, the natural world is incredibly complex, right? Um, is faith the best way to know God? I mean, it's a way. Um, again, people are asking me a lot of these best things. I'm a pluralist, you know? There isn't a best thing for human beings in a lot of cases, uh, when there is, it's usually hard to attain and, and you know, complex. So, yeah. Uh, Mataprog, what do you think about the Carnap critique of Heidegger's metaphysics? I don't think that Carnap actually has a critique. I think Carnap has a complaint that stems from Carnap and his own theory of language and verification, but I don't think it actually touches Heidegger's metaphysics at all. So, you know. All right. Um, on Kush, which secondary accounts for Hegel do you recommend to start with? I read a few primary material from Nietzsche, a few books by Sartre, but apart from it, just a couple of online courses. Well, you don't read Nietzsche or Sartre to understand Hegel. You read Hegel scholars to understand Hegel. Um, but I'm not a secondary source kind of person. I spend most of my time with primary texts. I'm not a good person to ask about those sorts of things. I'm sure there's a lot of literature out there about, you know, like teach yourself Hegel or Hegel made easy, but I would avoid those sorts of things because they're probably completely wrong. As a matter of fact, I'm going to get a dig in on somebody. So there's this guy, Paul Strathern, who had, you know, like X in 90 minutes. And I reviewed some of his books back in the 90s when they were first coming out. They're all garbage. <laughs> you know? Like you can't do Descartes in 90 minutes. You can't do Nietzsche in 90 minutes. You know, it's a recipe for misunderstanding what's what's going on. So um, I, what I would say is for Hegel is before you try to read the phenomenology, go to two other books of his. One is the lectures on the history of philosophy. The other is the lectures on the philosophy of history because those are easier. He's naming names. And um, when then you go to the phenomenology, you'll have some, some Hegel under your belt, so to speak. All right, Maid of Clay asks, uh, I was wondering if you've read any of Catherine Malibu's books. Haven't read any of Catherine Malibu's books. 
Um, she is actually a friend of my wife, so I probably should read some of her books, but um, haven't haven't gotten to it. Um, I'm, uh, let's see. Let me find some some new ones. What uh, Eli asks, what's Google Scholar? Just type it into Google, and it'll come up. Right? Google Scholar is this this feature of Google that's been around for about I don't know 15 years or so. You can find scholarly articles online um, that Google provides for you. Um, Change my mind. Can Stoicism without the metaphysics be, really be called Stoicism? Sure. Yeah, no problem. People do it all the time. Um, and it's not without the metaphysics. You mean Stoicism without the physics. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's all different ways of understanding Stoicism. There's multiple interpretations. Um, Marcos asks, what, what about philosophy makes it so attractive to you? Well, that's an interesting question. So, I mean, it's not something I think about very often these days. I've, I've been doing philosophy in, you know, academic ways and then practical ways. And I, I was always interested in the practical side of philosophy since I was an undergraduate. So, you know, that's starting 1990. Um, so now we're talking about 30 years in. And I had an interest in, in ideas that fit, you know, that later on I recognized as philosophical from the time I was a kid. So, you know, I found it an attractive thing to go into. I was very fortunate in that I, I was able to study the things that I wanted to study. Um, my professors were pretty hands-off a lot of the time. I was in places that turned out to have really good libraries. And um, I was able to find remunerative work, you know, for the first uh, uh, 11 years of my career, no, first nine years of my career, I was an assistant professor, first working for Ball State University, teaching at Indiana State Prison and their, their prison education program where they would earn, you know, bachelor's degrees. And I, I taught, you know, a huge variety of philosophy and religious studies classes there. And did a lot of scholarly work as well, you know. Then I, I, I was, uh, after the prison thing ended, um, which was, you know, largely a political decision, I had to get on the job market. And I went down to Fayetteville State University. And I, um, you know, taught philosophy and critical thinking classes. Um, I also got into academic leadership. If I had stayed there, I was ready to get early tenure and promotion. And I'd already started running university-wide assessment, and I'd help write the 10-year quality enhancement plan. But I, I wanted to move up to be with my, my then fiance, now wife, Andy Shaka. So from that point on, I, I started doing more entrepreneurial stuff, you know, public speaking and tutorials that I love, which is not the case for, for many of the people out there. I feel very bad for the current crop of graduate students. Um, so, you know, what is, what is attractive about philosophy? We have this, two, you know, essentially 2,500-year tradition of brilliant thinking that I can read maybe a tiny portion of, you know. And there's so many great minds that I don't agree with entirely, but I, but I love reading. Descartes is a prime example. I love reading and teaching Descartes, even though I'm not a Cartesian. Um, Sometimes I talk about myself as being a salesperson who has a product that sells itself. I just have to be able to, you know, effectively communicate about the things that we're studying and, and people latch on to it. Um, people of all walks of life, by the way. So those are some of the things that make philosophy attractive to me. Um, Pedro asks, am I okay? Yeah, I, I, I imagine you're asking because of the coronavirus uh, uh, epidemic that we're facing. Um, you know, we are confined to this, this apartment, but we're fortunate. You know, I'll tell you another thing, too, a little bit of back history. So when I moved up from Fayetteville, North Carolina, where I was an ass assistant professor at, at Fayetteville State University, up to the Hudson Valley in New York to be with my, <clears throat> my then fiance, now, now wife, Andy Shaka, who I've known since high school, by the way. Um, we, we, well, she was already living there, and I moved into what is called a carriage house apartment. That's an apartment above a garage. And we lived in 400 square feet with 
two dogs and two cats and all, all the books. <laughs> and I built bookshelves uh, myself for, for all of us. Um, we managed to do that for about well, 2011 to 2015, so four years, right? We did that for four years together. Living in this place, which is considerably larger and uh, much, you know, nicer looking and has good, you know, lighting and air and stuff like that up on the eighth and ninth floor in a building downtown of Milwaukee, we're doing okay. Um, we're, you know, I, I was uh, a little bit sick for a while. My wife was quite a bit sick. She got tested, doesn't have influenza, doesn't have corona. Um, we're practicing the social distancing and, and the protocols. We actually just made ourselves some, some you know, masks that I'm going to be using when I go walk the dog because uh, now it's recommended that we wear masks uh, whenever we go outside. Um, we have enough food. You saw <laughs> missing being able to go to the gym. I am missing getting to see my students and that sort of thing. Um, it is kind of sad to see our city because we live right downtown basically vacant. But yeah, we're I'm doing okay. I've got more work uh, than I can actually get accomplished. So I, I've had a few down days, but um, I, I, I've got, you know, tons and tons of, of things to do. So I don't get bored. Um, my wife is an amazing cook. I'm a pretty good cook. So we, we have good food here as well. And we're fortunate. We're both rather choleric people and we've worked a lot on our relationship and anger issues in the year the 10 years now that we've been together so you know we've been in quarantine now for over three weeks um so you know we're doing we're doing pretty good um i like you know it's nice to be with somebody that you like i i'm you know sorry for the people who are stuck with somebody who they they don't like that would really suck for this this quarantine so um Let's see what else we've got. It just bounced again. Um, all right. Uh, Sarah asks, what are my views on spiritual philosophy? I'm not really sure what spiritual philosophy means. Then she says, have I read the, the Bhavad Gita? Yeah, I've read and taught the Bhavad Gita. I mean... I, like I said, you know, when I was teaching at Indiana State Prison, I taught religious studies classes, and that was one of the texts that we would often refer students to. So, yeah. Um, Unknown asks, how do metaphysical things influence our mindset? I'm not really sure, because, I, I, you know, are we talking about, like, metaphysical ideas? Are we talking about... Um, about other things? I don't know. Lyndon asks about Rollo May. Good to see you, Lyndon, by the way, over there in Ireland. I started reading Rollo May as part of a reading group. What do you think of his view on Heidegger, intentionality, stoicism, hedonism? It's been a long time since I've read Rollo. It was actually Mai, right? Rollo Mai. Um, I, the stuff that I read I liked, but I don't remember enough about what he had to say. I, I should probably go back to it. That You know, you should, uh, you should write me because you know where to find me. And tell me about this reading group and about, about your thoughts, because I'd be interested to see what you have to say about that. All right. Um, Room 9 podcast. That is one of my favorite things about having only a high school diploma. I've had conversations with so many who are stuck in the, the ideas of their professors. I, I think you're referencing what I was saying before about, like, your professors at any given place have a lot of ideas about what's important and what's not. Now, I mean, you could easily have a high school education and be stuck in all sorts of other people's ideas of what's important and what's not as well. It could be a, uh, you know, a, a you know, a YouTube host or a uh, Instagram influencer, or whatever, whatever you want, or your boss, or you know, your your crazy uncle, or so. I don't know that that you know, simply having a high school education helps out in that respect. I think it's a more personal thing about whether you you like, you know, whether you you take in a wide variety of. Um, Voices, right? All right. Um, Sean Kelly, critical thinking question. Where do you place abductive reasoning with deduction and induction? Okay, so this is a little bit of a technical thing. Um, oftentimes when we're teaching about argument, we distinguish between deductive and inductive arguments. Deductive arguments are, um, you know, 
it, the way ideally they work is if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true if it's a valid deductive argument, right? Now, ideally, we want the premises to be true. Sometimes they're not, and then we say that it's an unsound argument. Um, so there's two ways deductive arguments can, can fail. Inductive arguments are not in terms of valid or invalid. They're weak or strong. They're, they're based on, <clears throat> you know, uh, is inductive rather than deductive. And actually, a lot of times when we're doing garbage science, we're, we're proceeding deductively rather than inductively. But abduction is something a little bit different. And the place that you would want to go for, you know, sort of the classic discussion of this is Charles Sanders Peirce's works. And he's, uh, and also, you know, another person I, I'm looking up there because his works are up there. Another person who's really good about discussing this is Umberto, Umberto Eco, by the way, um, because it turns out to play a very important role in, semi, in semiotics, right? Which, again, Charles Sanders Peirce, big, big early person in semiotics. So abductive arguments work in a different way. And, and you know, quite a few of the arguments that we make, and oftentimes what's called inference to the best explanation will be abductive. It's not the same thing as deductive or inductive. It's a third kind of inference. And um, so that, that, I mean, that's where I sit on it. And I think that we need all three of these working together. Um, so, yeah. All right. Seek no honors. Do you think we have free will? Depends entirely on what you mean by free will. Do I think we can, like, snap our fingers every time and pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and always choose the right thing no matter what? No, I, I, don't, I don't think. And I don't think that most of the people in the history of philosophy who think that we have free wills think that. Um, instead, I think, it, you know, it, it's very complicated. And as uh, uh, somebody was asking a little bit earlier, I'm blanking on exactly who it was, we do have to be able to account for how does, how does a free will work within a largely deterministic universe? So, yeah. Uh, Sarah asks, um, what are my views on capital punishment? Have I read thoughts on the guillotine by Camus? Yeah, I've, uh, ref reflections on the guillotine. Yeah, I've read, I've read that stuff. Um, and I, I think that capital punishment can be warranted in, in some cases and even needed. I also think that the way that we do it here in the United States, for reasons, and then once we do condemn somebody to to the death penalty, which we have in some of our states, um, they often languish for years and years and years before it actually happens, which um, you know offers the opportunity for them to become a very different person than the person who committed the crime. So, all right, Kyle asks, "What's my thoughts on the Frankfurt School?" Feeling really into some of that stuff, like Adorno, um, although I find him incredibly difficult to write on. Um, I've always enjoyed reading his work. And you know, Horkheimer is pretty cool too, and 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 you know Marcuse is this weird, wacky, wild guy. I don't really like Eric Fromm that much. Um, I've always found him a little bit sort of superficial, but maybe I'll go back and check him out again sometime in the future. And and you know whether Habermas really is a Frankfurt School person or not is I don't know, think I think kind of debatable. He certainly draws upon them, but I, I don't think that he's. I, this will probably be a controversial opinion. Um, I don't. I don't think he fits in quite as well with with them. Um, all right, uh, Mark Trumbull. Hey, Mark. Nice to see you. Do I think that Plato took the chariot metaphor found in the Phaedrus from the Parmenides poem? I do not. I, as a matter of fact, I think that they're structurally two totally different things. I don't. I don't think that that he took it from Parmenides. Um, I mean, I and here I'm just sort of speculating. I don't know. I mean, you know, do any of us <laughs> know about that? So yeah. All right. Um, Byringen. What are my thoughts on perennialism, the distillation of all religions to one forgotten one? I think that's wishful thinking nonsense that there's no uh, historical basis for. And I think it's kind of, you know, I think it overlooks, I think it, it, what it does is it takes such selective views on what's important in religions that I, I, I just don't buy it. Um, I'm, I'm more of a pluralist that way. And I think that it's important when we talk about religions to actually, to attend not to what we'd like them to be, but what, what they, you know, what they present themselves as phenomenologically. So I, I don't really buy that. 
Um, oh, man. Ron has a tough question here. My fiance is currently at a funeral where there's many people, friends and family. No one is wearing a mask or other protective gear. Do you think it was justified to tell her not to attend? Totally justified. Um, that is really imprudent to them not to do that. At this point in time, not only imprudent, but unjust. You should not be imposing uh, the chance of getting a illness, which is killing many people, even uh, people who are not immune compromised. There is no call for doing that. You know, um, Funerals are, are an important part of our life, but there's ways to do it, do it right. You know, people really lack a sense of proportion. And I think, you know, I hope she listened to you. Um, probably not, right? Because you say she's currently at the funeral. Um, but you were right to tell her not to do that, you know. All right. Uh, it's GT, baby, just stopping by to say I love your channel. Help me throughout my college course of ancient philosophy. Well, that's very nice to, to read. I'm glad it was helpful for you. Um, all right. Um, do, 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 do. So TMI says, uh, have you read Romanian moralist Emil Shoran? He was distinctively against being called a philosopher, though he's part of the postmodernist post -modernist current nonetheless. If so, what did you think? Haven't really read him other than little bits and pieces here, so I don't have a view on, on him. Um, breezy Free, what are your thoughts on languages? Deviation from referencing the external or objective to effectively communicate and the seemingly natural tendency towards dealing in abstraction and ethics. Um, I'm not exactly sure what's being asked there, but uh, I mean, that seems to be part of what language does. It abstracts, right? Um, and every language has uh, ethical terminology built into it that people use. So, yeah. Let's see. Ah, Mark asks, given the social isolation experienced by many, what, if anything, could be of interest from the Desert Fathers or other hermit traditions? Oh, um, you know, you could you could read around in the Desert Fathers. It depends on what, what you want to do with your time, you know. If, if what you want to do is, like, watch Netflix and eat chips and, you know, stuff like that, I don't think they'll be very helpful for you. If you want to, you know, try to use them the time to make spiritual progress, uh, then reading John Cassian or, you know, Evagrius Ponticus or people like that would probably be pretty good. Uh, Damon Forbes says, Aristotle says the brain is not fit for learning until 25. No, Aristotle doesn't say that. As a matter of fact, he didn't think the brain did the thinking. He thought the heart did that. So Aristotle definitely doesn't say that. Um, that said, he thought that when it comes to matters of ethics, um, we're not completely fit for, for understanding it. As a matter of fact, a lot of people after 25, because he says the immaturity can be in years or in, in the way in which people behave, but he thought young people could learn all sorts of things before they were 25. Mathematics is a prime example. So, yeah. All right. Um, let me see. We got about... Uh, 15 minutes left, so there's a lot of people asking multiple questions here and getting into conversations about the guillotine. I'm going to skip over all of that. Um, Boogie Reverie asks an interesting question. What sort of musical companions have you turned to during this quarantine? The same ones that I always do. You know, I'm a big metalhead. Um, I, I may have mentioned, well, some of you may have heard me talk as I did mention it, in my update video that I'm going to be doing <clears throat> a classic metal. I haven't decided whether to call it, you know, chat or class, or um, there was another C word that I thought about using. I can't remember offhand, but uh, you know, I, I, I'm going to be doing some stuff with that um, and some interesting, you know, presentation and discussion. Um, my, my wife has a much more, you know, broad musical palette. You could say, as a matter of fact, I don't know a single type of music that she actually doesn't like. And so we were listening to some stuff yesterday, a lot of, a lot of cool stuff that she, you know, turns me on to. Um, 
and you know, last night I actually got my banjo out and started playing a bit. I, I play and sing. Um, I also have my my it used to be my bass. I gave it to my daughter, and now she, it's still housed here. That I might start playing as well. And uh, you know, last night I played some Bill Withers uh, on, on the banjo. Uh, played some uh, um, Cracker and some Duran Duran. And what else did I play? Some Coldplay. Um, I, you know, I've got kind of eclectic tastes when it comes to that. And the Scorpions, Big City Nights. So, you know. All right. Uh, Kian Sarah, do you recommend any particular deontologist to read? Well, you definitely want to read Kant, right? Um, he is sort of like the big daddy of the deontologist. So you never want to deprive yourself of reading him. Uh, dark scale. Imagine right now, statistically, there are dozens of people as brilliant as Socrates, Nietzsche, Heidegger. Like right now, they have a male address and they breathe the air, same air as us right now. Um, yeah, probably the case. Um, so, all right. Uh, let's scroll down a bit. A lot of back and forth here. Oh, Nathan Orman has a good clarification. When I was talking about Gerhard von Rod, <clears throat> yes, it is Wisdom in Israel. That is the name of the book that he wrote about the wisdom literature. Really classic commentary and sort of interpretation of the biblical wisdom literature. Um, I like I like von Rod. I'm a big fan of his. All right. Uh, Let's see here. Got about 12 minutes before I got to get off and start doing some other work. Um, Christina Nash says, Kantianism, utilitarianism, or virtue theory, which is the one you think some, we as a society should practice more of? I'm a virtue ethicist. Now that said, um, you know, somebody I look up to quite a bit and had the opportunity to study with and formed a friendship with, uh, Alistair McIntyre, uh, he's very clear that, that virtue ethics had better incorporate some stuff from Kant and Mill, right? <laughs> that, that virtue ethics had not been done in this sort of abstract way where it's like one of three options or something like that. Virtue ethics, the real strength of it is being able to take in stuff from rival traditions and make sense of it. Kind of looking around and seeing if I can grab the, the book. Uh, right, up, right up here on the bookshelf, right? You see that uh, ethics and politics? There's an essay in there by McIntyre making that very point, right? So um, Caleb says, recently stumbled on your lectures on Kierkegaard. Do you think Kierkegaard still has valuable insight for compote religion in 2020? Not sure what compote religion is. Uh, let's see if there's any clarifications. Uh, I don't see that. We'll just say religion, right? Yeah, Kierkegaard has, Kierkegaard's always relevant. I mean, his emphasis on individual subjectivity and the, you know, the fact that we can't always communicate things to everybody else and make that the criterion for for what we uh, buy into, um, and his discussions. In you know, I, I, my favorite work by him, Philosophical Fragments. I think that's that's you know, I don't want I don't want to say the best work, but that's my favorite work because it deals with this this intrusion of the divine and the eternal into time in ways that we human beings could make sense of it. All right, um, Ethan, where can I get started with learning philosophy? Good question. Plato. Plato is a great place to start. Get yourself some Platonic dialogues. You don't even have to buy them. They're available online. You know, just type in Plato dialogues and there's plenty of websites where you can find it. I always say start with Plato. You don't have to stick with Plato, but, but Plato is a great starting point because so many other philosophers are going to be referencing him, right? And the dialogues are sometimes aggravating, but, but also quite fun. And, and so, you know, that, that's helpful. All right, here's a good question from uh, Atur. Do you think Wittgenstein destroyed philosophy as a whole? His analytic tradition is very harsh in his ordinary language philosophy. Wittgenstein did not destroy anything. <laughs> I mean, people are always saying, philosophy's dead. So-and-so did this. 
I mean, they do that with Heidegger too. You know, can't do metaphysics after Heidegger. Nonsense. I mean, how would we, same thing with Kant, right? Kant made this Copernican turn. We're all post-Kantians now. That's bullshit. You know, uh, there's no there's no one single person who like did that to philosophy. It's not Hegel either, by the way, or Nietzsche. Or, you know, uh, there's plenty of people out there pushing these narratives, and they always have an agenda when they push these narratives that usually involves them doing the important kind of philosophy. So don't don't buy into that sort of stuff. Philosophy is doing fine. And, and, you know, many people are, are you know, now that's not to say don't read Wittgenstein. There's some interesting insights there. You know, the whole language game, form of life thing, languages use, all of that. Although quite a bit of that you can get from other thinkers as well um, outside of the analytic tradition. So, all right. Uh, let's see here. Do, 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 do. Ooh. James asks, have you read all the Dune books? If so, which ones are your favorite? I have not. Um, if you mean, have I read all the Dune books that Frank Herbert himself wrote? Yeah, but I mean, his son is like, his son has really made an industry out of publishing stuff <clears throat> afterwards, right? It's to kind of go a little bit downhill, I would say. Um, all right, uh, Kyle asks, what's your thoughts on philosophers and, and artists hanging out? Do you have any experience of fruitful crossovers? Well, it's interesting you would ask that. I actually teach at Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design as the resident philosopher there. They brought me in to develop philosophy classes for their students. So as a matter of fact, a lot of my students are artists and designers. Uh, all sorts of different majors, ranging from like fine arts, illustration, to architecture, to communication design, and I love working with them um, uh, because they, they, they're, they're, there's so much interesting stuff that they bring to the table, and they are hungry for philosophy. Let me tell you, and you know, I like my colleagues there as well. Um, that's not the first time that I've ever interacted with artists. As a matter of fact, my very first job in college. As, as a student was working with the art department, both as a carpenter and as a docent, and then as an artist model. And I kept working with them uh, throughout my time in, in college. Um, you know, not the docent part, but, but uh, you know, I do other stuff with them and I got pretty close with them. So yeah, I was, you know, working with artists quite a bit. And then in graduate school, I had quite a few friends who were artists and I've always, you know, Every place that I've taught, I've I've known some fine arts colleagues that I've had some good relationships with, particularly you know at FSU. Um, so you know, uh, and then you know we can add to that as well because of my wife's connections, the culinary connections. Um, a lot of people don't think of you know culinary and baking and pastry as artwork, but it really is. It's the art that you 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 consume in the process. Um, and so I've had a lot of great, you know, interactions and conversations with them as well. So, all right. Uh, here is a very practical question by Corbeau. Uh, should the United States block respirator exports to Canada? If so, Quebec would lose a year worth of respirators. Our nurses are in panic mode. No, I think, I think you know, 90% of the stuff that the, the Trump administration is doing right now is posturing and, and you know, usually driven by greed and stupidity and, and vanity. Um, we should be coordinating our efforts with Canada. We should be, you know, there should be a coordinated effort across the United States to begin with. There shouldn't be any of this BS of letting governors, you know, like in Florida or Mississippi, rescind orders and let people go back to church or any of this sort of stuff. We shouldn't have Hobby Lobby opening up you know, stores again um, after being told that, that they need to close them down. All of that stuff should be, you know, gone, right? And we should be coordinating across the continent. Uh, instead, we're doing this, this stupid, you know, um, don't believe the experts driven by nationalism and, and, you know, trying to win another election sort of garbage that's, that's going on. I hope to God that they don't cut you off and, um, yeah, Quebec would, would, would be in, in quite a bit of trouble. Um, so that's about all I have to say about that. Zeno says, has anyone read Journey to the End of Night? It's a good read. So this is by Louis Ferdinand Céline. And I will say I certainly have, and I loved it. Uh, that said, it's probably the only book by Céline that I actually like. 
Um, and I haven't read it for a very long time. So, all right. I can't read Cyrillic writing, so I'm not sure how to pronounce this person's name. Um, please post more lectures on philosophy and science fiction. So interesting and informative. Yeah, that's, that's one of the things that's kind of gone by the wayside for right now, right? Because we, we um, can't meet in person for the Worlds of Speculative Fiction series. Unfortunate. Um, once I get caught up enough on other work, I think I might start doing some, some online events about philosophy and science fiction. But that's probably not going to happen in April. Um, I got so much class-related stuff I got to take care of, and I'm doing a lot of uh, ethics consulting, and also, you know, the work with Stoicism today is, is also consuming quite a bit of time. So um, we will do something, and we're probably going to be in quarantine for quite a while, so I'll, I'll do something, but I don't know when. All right. Um, let me see if I can find something good to go out on. We got about three minutes left before I got to get to other work. Um, doo -doo -doo. <clears throat> um, well, here's a quick one to knock out. Uh, Stargate, do you plan to make videos about rhetoric or Aristotle's organon? I already did. Uh, I did videos on Aristotle's categories. But will I make videos about the rhetoric? Probably. And then, you know, topics would be cool to do as well. Not super high on my priority list right now. But, um, yeah, um, let's see what else we got here. Oh, just jumped. Uh Do, 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 do. Oh, here's here's an interesting one. So, it says uh, this is from Nakusha. I'm reading Michel Foucault's The Order of Things. Do you have any thoughts on this book and how to approach it? That is a blast from the past, right? Uh, yeah, that that's a, a, a cool book by Foucault. Foucault, at, at one point, like said, I am not a structuralist. Bullshit. He is a structuralist in that book. You can actually take Grimace's, A.A.J. Grimace's uh, semiotic square and take Foucault's presentations of, of things in that book, and you can fit them into the square easy peasy, right? Um, and and it, it is an incredibly structuralist work. It's, it's an early work. It's part of you know, his, what we call his archaeological time as opposed to genealogical time. And I love it. I, I, I really enjoyed the, the order of things. Um, a lot of people just skip over it. Um, but it's, it's worth checking out. Reading the archaeology of knowledge can help with it. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, and, and this goes in general for Foucault, Foucault is an interesting historian. Don't, don't, don't uncritically trust his, his takes on things. He always has interesting things to say. And he is very often painstaking, but he is constructing a narrative. And that narrative is usually a lot cleaner than the real texts seem to say. I would also say this, too, about the history of sexuality and ancient philosophy. Don't place too much trust in, in Foucault's interpretation of, say, Seneca or Aristotle. There, you know, you, When you read it as, as somebody who does ancient philosophy, you're like, well, this is insightful. But a, about 20% of this is, is you know, just unsupportable bullshit. Uh, and you got to be able to distinguish the two of them from each other. So, all right, I am going to bring this to a close. Um, thanks so much for all of your questions. I'm glad we got to spend a little time together on this, for me, Saturday afternoon. Uh, I'm, I've got some, some work I've got to get to now, um, mostly having to do with my, my academic students and classes. So uh, we'll be having some other online events. You know, best place to find those is on the reasonio.com uh, events calendar, my Facebook page. Um, you know, you can find me in, in Twitter as well. I'm always posting about stuff there. So hope all of you are safe and um, stay so and stay healthy. Um, and, uh, you know, 
nobody knows what's going to happen in the next couple months. Anybody who tries to tell you that they they do know exactly what's going to happen is is probably got some sort of agenda, or they or they are unduly you know optimistic about their own ability to read the future. So, all right, that brings it to a close. Uh, I'll see you somewhere in the ether. <laughs>